RJ, it's been quite some time since I've last seen you. Probably five minutes. In person? <laughs> oh, in person, yeah. Well, wow. or 10 years for sure. I don't think that I've seen you in person since you were at University of Miami where... Nah. Yeah. No, you yeah. forget. What? Sometime, sometime after college, I bought a pedal from you. What? We had yeah, we had connected like on eBay. Oh no, you were selling a uh, an exotic AC compressor. No, not AC compressor. The the yellow thing, the AC dr drive or whatever. Okay. And I remember I I had bought it. It was on eBay. I bought it on eBay, and I figured it. Then we t put two and two together, and it happened to be you. So we emailed each other, and you invited me over to your place, and we hung out, and you played. You showed me a bunch of pedals before I bought that. The AC was it AC booster? Yeah, I think so. I think so. Yeah. Yeah, this probably was early two thousands. Jesus, I don't remember it. I know that was the last time I remember seeing you in person. That was like six lifetimes ago for me, anyways. Um, yeah. <laughs> so, you've done a lot since you left school, and I'm sure that a lot of your fans are probably expecting me to ask you, like, what kind of pickups are in that black guitar behind you, and. <laughs> You know, um, you know, what is your favorite pedals? And I'm really not interested in any of that. So I think just like half of your fans just left. <laughs> I don't know what pickups are in those anyways. Um, good, good. Well, see, he answered the questions, folks. He's just unstoppable. <laughs> He's unstoppable. But uh, well, I actually have questions about really how you got to where you are right now. And I think that a lot of people who enjoy your videos don't get that there was like massive amounts of perseverance behind all of that. Um, I remember you as my student um, vaguely because <laughs> like a woman of the night, I've had so many <laughs> um, or a man of the night. <laughs> um but I do remember you as a student and I remembered that you, you know, I was probably, um, what do you call, uh, poisoning the stew by saying, no, you should get involved with as many styles as possible. You need to be as good as, a, you know, at all these different genres, whatever. Um, and you actually did that. You did that when you were in school. And that in itself takes a lot. And I, I want you to talk about maybe what it was like to be in school and I'll, I'll lead you on from there. From there. Yeah, okay. So uh, when I got to the University of Miami, that, would, that was actually my second year of, of college. I had transferred from another school and I had entered as a major, uh, like a music engineering major, a MUI. And... Um, you know, I was going through the the whole process, taking all the calculus classes and all the classes that I didn't want to do. At the same time, I was watching all the, the jazz students get to play all the time and get to take all the fun classes. So towards the end of that year, I, I decided to like switch majors because I was basically getting jealous of, of the jazz students because that's what I wanted to do. So, you know, I auditioned, I begged my parents, I said, Mom and Dad, this is what I want to do. I did my audition, my entry audition to to change majors, and um, so I was on the five year plan for college, but it worked out. And um, you and many other people, yeah, <laughs> yeah, a little undecided, you know, at the start. But you know, I was pretty happy with the decision. I was very hardcore into the you know the curriculum and jazz and learning everything. For the first, I mean, for the first three years, and then the last year, I was kind of not freaking out, but I was like most people wondering what I'm going to do when I get out of college with a jazz degree. You know, this was like the late '90s too, so um, different, totally different environment, climate than it is before and now. But um, right around that time, I started listening more to radio and pop music and. Um, I was actually, and I, I don't know if you remember this, but I was actually set on moving to Nashville and becoming a studio, like Brent Mason, Dan Huff type of person. Yeah. 
So this would have been like what ninety nine is when I graduated. This is, but that was before you graduated, right? That this was like you were the last that? semester. Okay, okay. <laughs> so, I, th I I don't know if you I barely remember, but I think we were talking about country guitar, or I know I was talking to Randall, the head of the guitar department at the time, about country guitar and everything. Yeah. So, um, you know, I was still obviously learning the jazz stuff, but in my own free time, I was getting into pop music, pop guitar, studio guitar, country guitar, and, right. you know, that I played a country tune on my senior recital and I remember that. got in trouble and all that stuff. And you got in trouble because you wore Kiss makeup. Oh, that's true. <laughs> I forgot about that. <laughs> it had nothing to do with the uh, actual um, country song. It was that everybody in your group wore Kiss makeup and it was on for the entire senior recital. We, yeah. Yeah, I thought that was brilliant. Uh, Randall didn't. <laughs> <laughs> well, as long as the music was okay, I think I did all right. No, I thought it was. Okay. I actually thought it was exceptional. I thought you did an except. I'm not just saying that because I'm interviewing you and you're paying me. $700 to interview you. I'm saying that because I really thought that that was one of the standout, one of the last standout senior recitals. Because after that, um, the Randall, the head of the guitar program, for everybody who's wondering what Randall or who a Randall is, um, he said, no, no more of this. Yeah. And that was the end of the studio part of studio music and jazz. Our, for those of you who don't know, um, our degree at the time was called, I think it still is, Studio Music and Jazz Performance. Mm -hmm. Well, the studio music part was pretty much done. It was like 10% of the, the whole program. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It, was, it changed after that. So your senior recital was excellent, in my opinion. Well, I thank you. And I think, you know, towards that, the end of the year, my focus was still on, you know, the studio music part. Not so much the jazz, even though I love playing jazz still, and I was really into it. I think for from a professional standpoint, I wanted to get into the, the studio music scene and be a session guy or whatever. So I graduated, and I was unemployed. <laughs> For a while, you know I mean, what I'm thinking of. Do you remember that? Do you remember the, the the roll that they would keep the toilet paper in, and it and it would say it said MSJ degree, take one here, and it was like a long arrow that went right to the part where the toilet paper hung out, <laughs> and they 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 put a lot of elbow grease into trying to remove it, but they couldn't because somebody did it with permanent marker. So that's so, hilarious. I don't remember that. Yeah, but yeah, I mean it's like. I kind of expected it because, like, it's it's the music business, all aspects of the music business. It's hard to get into, and I knew knew that going into. So I did like little gigs, I did um, whatever coffee shop gigs. I taught privately. I you know I had to get a day job or whatever. And eventually, I I think I started just playing in a cover band, you know, playing at clubs, playing R and B music, playing weddings, stuff like that, and. Which was great because at the time, you know, when I was working a day job, g getting to play music again was such a, a breath of fresh air. So eventually, the the gigs got busier. I got more of them, so I was able to quit uh, my day job, which was selling cell phones. And you know, I I was able to do yeah. I was very lucrative, by the way. Yes, but um, yeah, I was able to make a, an okay living just playing you know, at the local clubs, Miami Beach, Fort Lauderdale and all that stuff, plus yeah. weddings here and there. So I did that for many years. And then um, eventually I met a bunch of different people, met a different bunch of different musicians, and I got into touring. You know, I got phone calls and whatnot. Uh, got into touring, got into a little bit of studio work, just being in town. That's, you know, that was a big deal was just like, Staying in town long enough to make the connections to uh, to get different gigs and sessions. Right. So it kind of, you know, snowballed from there, sessions, tour work, blah, 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 all that stuff. And then yeah. I eventually moved to L.A. for a little bit, and then now I'm in Nashville. 
the you, YouTube stuff. But you, but you you were doing like a lot of touring at one point, right? Yes. It's funny because like I had set a goal in my mind or put it out to the universe that I wanted to be so busy with gigs and touring that I had to turn down stuff. And I did. I got so busy that I actually had to leave a gig because I was doing two different touring gigs at the same time. And and one of them, and then, you know, I, it caught up with me. I was, you know, double booking myself on these tours and stuff. So um, I had to do stuff like that. But yeah, I mean, that was kind of my goal was to be so busy. I, 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 I read, uh, blah, 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 um, the, yeah, <laughs> thank you. Um, and that's why I don't teach at UM anymore. Um, <laughs> 17 years, folks, 17 years, I did my time. Um, so the amount of perseverance that you had to, um, forget about perseverance, serious effort to get into the touring thing was monumental, right? Yeah, but I wouldn't say it was like like a serious effort in the sense that I was so stressed out about it and I had to call a bunch of people and say, hey, I'm available for touring and all that stuff. I kind of, and this has kind of been my MO even in college, is I just kind of let things fall into place and like let the phone calls come to me and what emails come to me. I didn't like seek it out actively necessarily. At least that it didn't feel like it. I just kind of, you know, met people, made friends. And if they call me, great. If they don't call me, yeah, but okay. you, you weren't at home, like, sitting, reading comic books or, or what have you, and, and practicing, you know, your scales and stuff like that, and expecting the phone to call. You were out there actually gigging. Yes. Yeah. I was gigging, yeah. and ha I was having fun. Yep. Yeah. And, and, you know, whatever happens, happens. That's kind of like my, my credo. And, you know, if it happens, great. If it doesn't, great. You're, so so is that how you ended up well let me let me um backtrack a little bit so after the touring and after the move to nashville mm -hmm. when did you decide to stop touring i had the bug to stop touring probably 2017 ish so i was still touring up until the end of 2018 but I think it was around 2017 where I was kind of getting the idea to do YouTube full time and then quit touring altogether. Um, but it was it's it's a scary thought, you know, because especially when you're in Nashville and you're a Nashville touring musician, it's a good job because it's very steady work. You can always count on it for the for the most part, except for this year, obviously. But um, it's a it's it's a hard job to leave, you know. It's to uh, secure the security and everything. So I had the thoughts starting around 2017, but I decided to do it another year because I didn't want to totally leave it. And then 2018 was kind of my last full year of touring, and I and I knew that going into it, and I intentionally did as many touring gigs as I could. So. Normally, I have one gig for the whole year, which is, it was with uh, Thompson Square, who's a kind of a country duo act here. But um, I started the year actually subbing in for this metal band called Stone Sour. Then I went back to the country gig, and then towards the end of the summer into the fall, I was doing an R&B tour with this awesome singer named Judith Hill, and we went to Europe twice. Yeah, she's killer. So I got it all out of my system in 2018 because I knew at the end of the year I was going to quit, Brilliant. retire temporarily. Okay, well, here's something that I thought of that nobody seems to ask touring musicians, and you can decide not to answer this question if you'd like. Um, I know you're married. How difficult is it to keep your relationship going when you're on the road? I am extremely lucky because when I met my wife, when we started dating, I we we met in LA and we started dating and then maybe four months later I went on tour. 
So she, it's almost like our relationship works best <laughs> when I'm on tour. Or that's kind of how it all started, you know? Um, so we're used to it. So, um, and you know, it, at, at, at my age or whenever I was touring when we met, there was no sex, drugs, and rock and roll at that point. You know, there, well, there never was sex, drugs, and rock and roll. So it wasn't, it's not that type of, I don't do the debaucherous t- touring work. Just the, just the distance. A lot of musicians wonder and worry about and think about if, if I go on the road or if I do anything that's away from home and I have a, I have a girlfriend or I have a fiance or I have a husband or wife, what have you, how am I going to keep it going? Yeah. I mean, it's, it, it all kind of depends on the tour, too. Like a lot of the you know pop tours, they'll go out maybe like a month and a half, and then you're home for two weeks. So that's kind of that kind of schedule, maybe during the summer or whatever. Um, so that's hard because, you know, maybe six weeks you don't see each other. With Nashville, that's totally different. So when I when I started w- doing the Nashville gig, it was kind of like a breath of fresh air because the Nashville schedule is so regimented. It's like um, you're out basically Wednesday to Sunday tops. So you're home Sunday evening or afternoon, and then you're home Monday, Tuesday, sometimes Wednesday, and you're out. You're like you're they they call it weekend warrior stuff. So it was very rare that I was out for more than two weeks at a time. So it was a little more comfortable than being out for over a month. I, I wonder if your followers even knew or know that you lived in L.A. Some of them do. I mean, I lived in L.A. for, what did I say, six years? Six or eight years, I can't remember. Um, so it was a decent amount of, I say like, the majority of my 30s I was in LA that's a pretty ballsy move to move out there isn't it yeah I mean it's kind of the rite of passage for a lot of musicians you know Um, at the time when I moved out to LA I had just gotten done with my the Ricky Martin tour that I did so I was kind of like high on the hog I had you know that from my resume and all that stuff. Does that mean you made tons and tons of money with Ricky? <laughs> I made a good, that was probably the most I had made at that point, um, just playing music. Yeah. So, um, but when I moved to LA, I kind of had, it was weird. Like I, I, I didn't want to do the gig anymore, the Ricky gig. But I still wanted to do it because of, you know, that that was all I had and the paycheck was good and everything. But I did move to L.A. to kind of get away from the scene in Miami, which was, you know, Latin pop, hip hop, R&B, uh, all, all the other stuff, and try to get into, like, the pop tours and the rock tours and everything. That was kind of my intention of moving to L.A. And um, the funny thing is... A lot of the touring work that I did when I was living in LA was out of Miami still, so I was still getting like the Latin touring gigs. So yeah, it didn't you really. Weren't, uh, you weren't stuck out. in the Miami vortex, which which um, Andrew and I talked about. That it's very easy to be in Miami for decades. Oh yeah. Um, and a lot yeah. of the same people that have been here for decades have been here for decades. <laughs> oh yeah, I mean I. I've probably, my time in South Florida was almost as long as my time growing up in Detroit. I think I was in South Florida for 14 years before I moved away. So you did the, you did your Nashville stint and, um, I'm sorry, excuse me, you did your, do that again. You did your, you did your time in LA and then you drove cross country to Nashville. Pretty much. Well, the details are we had we were planning on moving out of L.A. to Chicago when I got this Nashville gig. So for the first year and a half, I was actually paying rent in Chicago, but working out of Nashville. 
So I was commuting between Chicago and Nashville for like a year and a half. Right. Very doable. Very doable. Yeah, it's, it was fine. I like, I mean, Chicago is a great city. I love it, but winters suck. So yeah. Nashville's a little bit better. So now that you're doing this, um, now that you're a YouTuber, content creator, mm -hmm. um, a lot of new doors have opened up for you. And you've met a lot of different kind of people, a lot of your heroes, I imagine, too. Oh, yeah. Um, talk about that for a moment. I mean, if you would have asked me where I would have been five years from five years ago, I would never have thought that it would be doing this full time. It's so it's such a weird thing that just popped up in the music business because it is kind of music business still. Yeah, total music business. Yeah. So I mean, it's like a it's it's a it feels like it's a brand new kind of business or um, what's the word I'm thinking of? I can't think of it, but. Um, you know, YouTube's been around since like 2005, 2006, mm -hmm. and um, and now it's like big business. It's essentially owning your own TV studio or cable chat, cable network, or whatever. Um, so it's all kind of new and it's always changing. But um, it's 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 cool because the community, especially at least in the guitar community, as far as I know, the it is a community and it's super cool. All of the guitar YouTubers are buddy buddy with each other. You know, we have the the gear demo guys, we have the you know, lesson guys and gals and we have um you know, the uh, the uh, you know, everything interspersed in between, vlogger, whatever you want to call it, but we're all kind of we all know each other. Um and all, we're all respectful of each other, and I haven't I haven't uh, noticed or heard of any kind of competition or any of that kind of shade going on. I'm sure there is, but um, no yeah, I mean, I I feel like I know a lot of the the YouTubers that are, you know, kind of in the circle, um, and you know, I've gotten a lot of opportunities. And, you know, last year, it's funny, I had no intention of traveling last year. I had every intention of just staying home, being a YouTuber, but I traveled actually a decent amount last year. Um, I don't know if you've ever met Henning Pauli, but he's a crazy German uh, YouTuber. He's got an amazing studio, and he set up an event that he invited a bunch of YouTubers to his his um, complex. He basically owns like a block in this village in in. in Germany and um, he invited I can't remember how many YouTubers 20 or so and we all went there he invited a bunch of companies Ibanez uh, Rev Amps you know amp companies guitar companies pedal companies we spent four or five days there and made content he's got like a TV studio it's crazy like when I say a TV studio he's got multiple areas with like all these black magic cameras and a, a, a switching control center and all this stuff in his house. It, it sounds like how Stuart Copeland's brother, Miles Copeland, has these writer sessions in a ca castle. This, yeah, it's essentially kind of like that, where we all get together and be creative. Yep. And um, I would never thought that would have been a thing, but it is. So even through that, I got to meet different YouTubers. I got to meet all the companies. Um, and that obviously when you meet people, I always tell people you got to network, you got to meet people, you got to befriend people because that always turns into other relationships down the road. So this past NAM in January, I got invited to another YouTuber event before NAM, and I got to meet Steve Vai and interview him for like 10 minutes. Well, this interview is going to be way better. What's that? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. You interviewing me is way better than me interviewing Vi because I only got to ask him one question. <laughs> oh, wow. Okay. Um, so how disciplined, well, how disciplined were you and have you become? With regards to what? With, with regards to things done. Like, obviously you put the time in. I remember. I, yeah. I remember you did that. 
I remember you were a hired worker. Um, are you still like that? Do you, do you make lists and do you do, you know, that sort For of thing? For the most part, I mean, we've had a conversation about like, um, you know, workflow as far as doing this video thing and YouTube stuff. It but never yeah, happened. I, I no, did. no, we didn't. Okay, we didn't. <laughs> I've learned along the way how to, to do YouTube. I didn't know when I, you know, when I first started, I had no idea what I was doing. I had no plan of, you know, doing guitar lessons. I had no plan on speaking in front of a camera for the longest time. I just did get gear demos. That was my thing. I was the guy that didn't talk during a gear demo and people like that. So, but you know, I just kind of pivoted it all the time and like, okay, let me try this. Let me try that. So I learned how to kind of get, you know, more focused on the planning of videos. Um, I, I, I get to the point where sometimes I write complete scripts and I have a teleprompter just so I sound intelligent. So yeah, it gets pretty serious, but I do, I do a little, I do pre-plan as much as I can. So I have like spreadsheets and, uh, I use a, an app called Notion, which is kind of like you, you know, plan projects and whatnot. So I have a list of videos and I have a list of gear demos that are in the, the loop that I have to get done. Um, and then within that app, I can write my scripts. I can bullet point certain things or take notes and whatnot. Do you, so, find, do you find script writing really helps you when you're, when you're recording? For me, it does. Because a lot of times when I click record on the camera, I'm just like, uh... Uh, and it's, you know, I did that the first couple of times and I, like when I was editing, I'd be like, Oh, I forgot to say this. I forgot to, you know, I forgot a lot of information that I wanted to put in the video. So, um, I tried just putting like an outline or bullet points, but then like when I'd be recording, I would just stare at it and be like, okay, so how do I want to say this? It's a lot faster. <clears throat> My workflow is a lot faster if I just write out exactly what I want to say, or at least the, the meat and potatoes of it, at least the intro part. Um, and then sometimes I'll just kind of do it on the fly after that. But it does help me in particular because I'm not a good uh, talker in front of a camera like this. <laughs> well, I think that, I mean, it, people a lot of times, I feel, viewers can tend to take the, our videos for granted. They don't know how much goes into each video. I mean, the hours, the takes, up, take after take, like they see you play a great solo and they're like, yeah, RJ's a great player. Um, did RJ do a 700 takes before that? Um, you know, there's a cup, like on some of my gear demos, if I have a bad day, yeah, sometimes I'll have like multiple takes. Sometimes I will punch in stuff because it's you know I, m I missed a note but the rest of the solo was so good so I'm like ah screw it and sometimes I'll leave clams in my solos I don't care but um, for the most part I try to get everything done in the first two or three takes um, well that's but you, were, you were saying like how editing is a lot of the game and it's true but it's also it doesn't have to be, you know, you could be someone like Tom Bukovac who just clicks on his iPhone, press, presses record, talks and plays for 15 minutes and then uploads it. So if you're lucky enough <laughs> to be, to be able to have good content without editing, that's awesome. Well, or it could be like my videos where I just keep the mistakes in and turn Dang it into, <laughs> I got Dang tired, you. I got tired of editing my mistakes out. Yeah. So I was just like, it's going to be part of the funny aspect. A lot of people don't care. So one of my, one of the last videos I did, I think it was like the four levels to Little Wing. I had, I thought that video sucked because I, that was one video that I didn't outline or I didn't write a script for. I just kind of did it off the cuff and there was a lot of editing involved and I was kind of blah, blah, blahing. And it did really, really well. I was shocked. So you never know what people are going to um, like or resonate with. So, 
so ultimately the 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 thing that I like to ask all of the all of my interviewees is that what it is yeah I'm the interviewer um is how, what would you recommend to people who are trying to be like you there are a lot of people who really really love your playing look up to you um love your gear demos love the fact you don't talk in a lot of them um and just totally dig your playing and they and they're like wow he does this, he does jazz he does slide playing he can play country he can play rock how do they get there well as far as you know being able to play the different styles for me that's just because I love so many different styles of music. So it's not something that like I intentionally said, oh, I need to learn jazz. I need to learn uh, reggae and Latin music. It's just music that I enjoy listening to. So I guess you have to be passionate about the music that you want to learn or else it's not going to work. You know, you're going to be faking it. Um so that's kind of first and foremost. As far as learning the different styles, you just really have to absorb yourself in that style of music. And a lot of it has to, a lot, you know, something that helps is playing with someone that actually knows what they're doing. So like, for instance, reggae. I thought I knew reggae music, you know. I thought it was just simple chunk, chunk, chunk. But then, boy, was I wrong when I started playing with a reggae band, Inner Circle, first rehearsal, I was doing what I thought was reggae and they're like, no, the feel is wrong. It's more like this. And they kind of taught me the laid back feel of it and how to feel the music. So had I not known that or had I not played with those guys, it's like I would have just been faking the feel, faking the funk. So, And as an aside, would you like to sing one of their most famous songs? A la 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 long, a la 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 long, long, le long, long, long. Bad boys. Bad boys, bad boys. What you gonna do? Yeah. Excellent. Um, so, I I see what you've easy. done. <laughs> see what you've done. See, they don't like my singing. So that, so you, um, you learn the language by being in the country where they speak the language, essentially. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. It's kind of like, you know, immersing yourself when you're immersing yourself in a language, you're you know, you go to the country and you you talk with the people. That's how you learn languages. So, it's exactly the same thing with music. You just have to dive right in and basically obsess over it and get really into it, which is something I do with basically everything I do. So <laughs> it's you, like so you've done the If I'm into something, I obsess over, over it. it. So you've done the same thing with country, you've done the same thing with slide, you've done the same thing with... Uh, I've done everything, country, I mean, cooking, <laughs> skateboarding, non-musical stuff, motorcycles. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I nerd yeah, out I, about I, a I lot really of things. I really do think we all suffer that. I did the same thing, or I mean, I still do the same thing with Illin Pipe reed making. Sure, with Jiu Jitsu. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's the same thing. And that's, not a lot of people are like that. Really? Yeah. I mean, I, I wouldn't say my wife nerds out on certain things. When I say nerd out, it's like, you know, just like tuning out and like watching YouTube videos over and over again of stupid stuff. See, I know for a fact my late father did, did that. He would mm -hmm. do the same thing, like get into one thing and just be crazy about it. Um, yeah. So maybe I saw that and learned it. I, I've always been like a pedagogy freak from the time when I was a child getting picked on. And I remember seeing, oh, there's this, there's this comic where if you get sand kicked in your face, <laughs> then you buy this thing and you follow the steps and you're going to be like, you know, and nobody will yeah. kick sand in your face anymore. Was that Charles Atlas or something? Charles Atlas, yeah. <laughs> I should like cue in like the Charles Atlas thing right here. Oh, yeah. Know? And... um yeah, exactly. And uh, so, it, so it takes that, right? So you've done the same thing with YouTube. You've done the same thing with your cameras, the same thing with your guitars, the same thing with slides, what slide mm -hmm. to get, the same thing with pedals, and on and on and on and on. And, yeah, it's, it's an obsession. And that's what it takes to be successful. 
Yeah, it's a healthy obsession in the fact that I love learning about these things. You know, I'm passionate about camera gear. I'm passionate about studio gear. Not so much what pickups or controls are in the guitar, but, you know, um, and just playing and music and everything. That's the thing I like to get across. I think everybody really has their own success story and um, their own perseverance story. And I think that my goal in doing these interviews is to try and draw that out of the people that I'm speaking with. So it, it, there's, a, there's enough... What, what kind of diminished patterns can I use over whatever card? Yeah, you know? exactly. I, there, there's a lot of that on YouTube. And another video about, hey, RJ, how do you do that um, swing lick with your slide on this, blah, blah. You know, it, there's a lot of that stuff already. And if anybody wants to figure it out, slow down RJ's videos, you'll find out. Um, <laughs> and I got to text my wife real quick. Okay. How, long, how much longer do you want to go? No, we're going to be done in a second, but I can give you text your wife music. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. It's yeah. beautiful. Thank you. I've been working on it all day. Um, <laughs> so really, that's, um, that's it. That's it, because I, this, that's the point I wanted to really not the point but the the vibe i wanted to draw out of you and that's i think people what people are going to get is that rj is not some guy who just like gets a pedal from a company turns it on yeah you know what i mean like yeah, yeah there's a bit of that but there's a lot behind it i had to even get the chair to go lot <laughs> behind it there's a lot behind it. there's a lot of years there's a lot of um kinetic energy there's a lot of momentum there's a lot of skill that led up to this moment where somebody has just gone like this, click, oh, I love this, you know, and that's it. Yeah, it's just about loving what you do, I guess, you know. Yes, and that is a great place to stop. So, RJ, thanks a million. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Professor. <laughs>